1967, four months before a white supremacist bullet ended his life, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a lecture where he voiced what has become one of his most enduring ideas. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. All right, put me to work. With those words as inspiration, I'm going in at the nation's premier Muslim civil rights group. The Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE. CARE has 35 affiliates across the country, and they've been protecting the civil liberties of American Muslims, building coalitions, and promoting justice for more than 25 years. And today, I'm their intern. So we're also trying to identify public listservs, the public interest listservs. There's no coffee fetching and lunch orders here. It's a small office dealing with big issues. What kind of people will volunteer? Who is there like a oh, typical? All types of people. Yeah. So many different backgrounds. It's, it's been pretty amazing actually since Trump. Um, we've been having, there was a week when we had like, like a month where we have like three volunteers coming every single day and help us out. It's been really amazing. On this afternoon, CARE New York's legal director was getting prepped for a series of lobbying meetings at City Hall. The uh, meeting went very well with co-counsel yesterday for um, the potential NYPD class action about uh, Muslim detainees and uh, really heartbreaking. We also need to prep uh, for the upcoming uh, murder trial. How's the family feeling? They're just they still know. very frustrated, yeah. Uh, and, and the main thing is just trying to convey to them that it, it's going to take time and that we may never have a clear explanation for why this happened. Murder trials, mobilizing members, delivering leaflets to airports, plus planning a gala, proofreading translations, and recruiting interns. The tedious tasks and major lifts that CARE deals with day to day. Everything all right. Thanks, guys. Let's get back to work. Can I ask one question before you guys? So this was as boring as any staff meeting I've ever sat in at <laughs> any nonprofit. What do you think the reality of this meeting and the work you do is versus the perception of what the work you do is? Like from someone who lives two blocks away from here who just walks by the building and is like, oh yeah, that's where the Muslim people are. You know, when people think that's where the Muslim people are, I don't know what they're thinking, to be honest with you. I mean, that's part of it. So that, that's already a wild card. Right. If they understand what we do, and we are a civil rights advocacy organization, then they may think huge things like the Washington Square Park rally that we had, right, where thousands came up and there were helicopters flying above uh -huh. us. So they may think in those terms. But then also there's the internal role of the organization to build our capacity for those that we serve, and that's really important. And that's where a lot of the boring stuff comes in, right. but it needs to be done. Do you feel like you're in like a reactionary spin all the time, or are you feeling like more offensive or defensive at this very moment? I always say that we're both proactive and reactive, and we need to be, right? Mm -hmm. Proactive means trying to engage with the community before anything happens. So some of the stuff that we spoke about at the meeting had to do with Know Your Rights workshops. Getting that information out, letting people understand what their rights are is really important. And then reactive is having to go into the airports because something just happened at the wave of a pen and we need to be reactive. Reactive is also sometimes when the client calls up and no one else in the entire world knows about what this person is going through, right? And we have to react to that person's situation. We have to go, whether it's something like visit somebody at the hospital because they've been a victim of a hate crime or work discrimination with the client and saying, look, I can't pay for my child's diapers and this is all because I'm Muslim. Ten years ago, you guys released American Muslims, a journalist guide to understanding Islam and Muslims. So, ten years on, what do people in my field need to know that they didn't learn back then? So, I think one of the most problematic things we deal with constantly is the double standard on terrorism. Yeah. Time and again, we see the media framing of an attack completely change if it's someone with a you know, who practices Islam, so I'm from a Muslim majority country, so I'm with a name associated with Islam. Yeah. We associate violence with this religion, not because that's the fact, but because that's the default assumption. And when you see white supremacist terrorists 
killing people in Charlottesville, killing people in black churches. That is terrorism, and yet our laws and our media framing don't see the equivalence. The media framing needs to change, and the media needs to understand that anytime someone commits an act of violence because of an ideology, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their faith, that is terrorism. You can't do this work without being driven and without being passionate and understanding that you're really impacting people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis.